Members of the priesthood that assemble at Highbury Park, how are you this day? If you're happy in the Lord, say amen. amen. If you're glad to be in the household of faith where you can worship God in spirit and truth, say praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Thank you. I want to just say that um, this sermon is for me. And you'll see why in a few minutes. In fact, it's quite evident. Um, about two weeks ago, my daughter attended a week of orientation at Queens College for high school. She's transitioning from grade six into grade seven. And um, apparently in one of her English literature classes, uh, the teacher gave them a poem to analyze, to critique. And she liked the poem a lot. In fact, one night uh, while we were home, she pulled it out of her bag and uh, asked me to look at it. She shared it with me. So I want to share it with you. The poem is entitled, To My Grown-Up Daughter. My hands were busy through the day. I did not have much time to play. The little games you asked me to, I did not have much time for you. I bought your clothes. Mother taught you how to cook. But when you would bring me your picture book and ask me to share in your delight, I would say, a little later, not tonight. I would tuck you in all safe at night and hear your prayers and turn off the light. Then tiptoe softly to the door, I now wish I could have stayed a minute more. For life is short and the years are rushing past. My little girl has grown up fast. No longer is she at my side, her precious little secrets to confide. The picture books are put away. There are no longer games to play. No goodnight kisses, no prayers to hear. That all belongs to yesteryear. My hands, once busy, now are still. The days are long and hard to fill. I wish I could go back and do the little things you asked me to. You know, uh, I thought about the poem a lot. I talked about it with Chriselle, and I realized that uh, a long time ago, I had stopped spending time the way I should with my daughter. I think it touched me because she was saying it in her own words, but through the poem, she was telling me that I hadn't been spending enough time with her. And she was also saying to me, and I, I took it to heart, that the time that I have been spending on this side, I wasn't spending it in the things that really count. And upon further reflection, I have concluded as Solomon had concluded many years ago when he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, that much of what I have been doing was simply chasing after the wind. There are many things in this world that people chase after, and I would say all of it is meaningless, nothing but meaningless chasing after the wind. Today's sermon, for those who are counting, is entitled Time Well Spent. I want us to think about how we are spending our time as I myself ponder this very important question and I think about how I have spent my time. One of my favorite rock groups, forgive me for indulging, um, you may not enjoy or appreciate that genre of music, but I do. And there is a group that some of you 
who are dating yourself by me saying this, know. The group is called U2. And in 1987, this Irish rock band had its second number one hit. The song was entitled, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. If you listen to the words from the chorus, it's quite interesting. It says, I have climbed the highest mountains. I have run through the fields. I have run. I have crawled. I have scaled city walls. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Interestingly, when interviewed, lead guitarist The Edge called that song a gospel song even if it doesn't sound like one. The entire song captures the spiritual searching expressed by the writer of Ecclesiastes because that song describes our culture today. You see, we have many people who are searching, but they're running around. They're scaling walls. They're looking for something, but they're not finding it. They find themselves very, very busy doing all kinds of things. But sadly, too many of them are simply chasing after the wind and not using their time well. To many of us, in fact, even here as we congregate at Highbury on this Lord's Day, too many of us are searching for the wrong things. Too many of us are focused on the wrong things. Too many of us are wasting our time. Wasting our time in the accumulation of things, material things. Wasting our time in the pursuit of work. Wasting our time for, for status, to be recognized by the world for various reasons, and even in the pursuit of wisdom. And some of us are wasting our time and worldly desires and the lust of the flesh. So all of these things I want to address today because I think it's important for us to appreciate that we need to find time well spent. Time spent on things that really matter. And sometimes those things we get lost or we forget about because we get distracted by the things of the world. The accumulation of things, particularly we see a lot going on in our country, don't we? It seems that more and more we've become a obsessed society, obsessed with consumerism, obsessed with having the latest gadget. Interestingly, a typical supermarket in the United States in 1976 stocked about 9,000 items. Today, in 2018, that same supermarket carries 30,000 different items. Why? Because we have almost become obsessed in the belief that more is better. The more options we have, the better we are, right? You know, Solomon, the richest man in the world at the time, thought that too for a while. And he spent much of his life striving for more. But still, the more he accumulated, the more he accrued, the more things that he managed to, to gain, it left him feeling empty, as he expresses in the book of Ecclesiastes. He found no contentment in possessing more. There was a time, folks, believe it or not, when there was only one option for cars. It was called the Model T. And it was invented through the great genius of Henry Ford, um, a wonderful vehicle. But no one had any other options. Everyone had a Model T if they could afford it. Well, you know today, <laughs> we live in such a consumer-driven society. You have so many different cars to choose from. Different sizes, different makes, different models, different colors, sporty cars, cars that are for load-bearing trucks, for example, luxury vehicles with that smooth drive, I suppose, convertible tops. 
But you know, this again is simply a chasing after the wind because as you get that one vehicle, all of a sudden it's nice and you like that new car smell. But after a couple months, and I have experienced this recently, the new car smell goes away. And then you see someone driving something a little better, a little hipper. Um, the, the young people like to say lit, you know, a car that's chill. And I'm, I, I know I shouldn't be using these words, Yudeja, you're laughing. Um, you can blame Landy on that for to me. He's introduced me to the, a whole new vocabulary that 20-somethings are using. And at my age, I probably shouldn't be using. But nevertheless, so we move to the next vehicle and then we, we, we enjoy it for a time, don't we? But then it becomes old, or there's some new vehicle that comes out that's even better, a hybrid, or something else. So we are always seemingly chasing after the wind with these vehicles, aren't we? You know, this, this obsession with wanting material things is quite evident in the Bible with the example of King Ahab. In 1 Kings 21, we see that King Ahab, as, as king of Israel, he had everything. He lived in a palatial palace. He had all the land that you could ever want. And yet as he looked over, nearby him was this property, this vineyard owned by Naboth. And, and he coveted that, not, not because it was special per se. Yes, it, it probably had good, good grapes. It, it probably made good wine. But because it wasn't his, he simply wanted it. His greed, his covetousness led him to take that man's property and, and basically have the man killed because of the insatiable desire for more. He could not stop at what he had. He had to have someone else's. And this is an extreme example. But it shows us the drive for more can danger and damage our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Amen? As was the case certainly with Ahab. But we see it in our society today. You know, the Honda is a very hot car in the Bahamas. I don't mean hot as in temperature. It's hot in the sense that thieves, people are in the business of stealing. Those that like to thief, as we say. They love the Honda because you could take the engine out of a stream and you could put that in a Civic or in a Accord and it fits perfectly. And so there's a whole cottage industry of people going out there and stealing those cars and they're selling those parts to unscrupulous bush mechanics and used car properties who turn them around and are going to sell it for profit to us. And that tells us about the dangers of consumerism, of a society gone wrong, where we are coveting car parts and cars to that extent. Well, it's not just cars. Let me drop anchor on the cell phone. I was driving yesterday back from Gladstone Road. I took that route along JFK down to Saunders Beach. And I happened to pass the headquarters of BTC. And they have on their wall a big, massive advertisement for the Galaxy S9. And I thought to myself, self, what's wrong with a, with a bubbler? What is wrong with the Nokia? How far have we gone that they've got to S9? They went through S1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. They're on 9. I'm like my daddy. I'm thinking, you know what? A phone should be good for two things. To make calls and receive calls. Amen. But you know, our young people, they want phones with lots of apps and lots of space for, I don't know what, for Instagram and smart chat, all kinds of things I don't even know about. Yes, Amanda, I know you know what I'm talking about. But the thing here is, are we getting too obsessed with having the latest gadget, the latest phone? How far are we going with this materialism? Because to me, it's simply a wasted time. It is, as Solomon would say, chasing after the wind. Can I have an amen? amen? 
And let me turn my attention for one last moment as I ponder on this chasing after the wind with materialism in mind. Have you noticed the proliferation this current summer session on camps? We live in a digital age, it seems, where parents are so busy. We don't have time for our own kids, so you know what we do? We push them out of the house and send them to a camp. There are swim camps. There are math and reading camps. Rochelle. There are literacy camps. There are gymnastics camps. I know about that too. My daughter is going to an art and music camp. We've gotten so camped out. We have like specialist camps now. We don't just do like general camps. There's basketball camps. You, you name every kind of camp you want. We have it now in the Bombers. But you know what we're not doing? We are not spending quality time with our kids. We're passing our kids off to a camp. And all of this is simply chasing after the wind. If our relationships are not there, grounded in the faith in the almighty God above, and focused on imparting that knowledge to our children. I'm here today to tell you that the little things count. Spending time with kids can never be replaced. Spending time with your kids, teaching them the word of God can never be replaced. Spending quality time with your child, whether it be snorkeling or building a sandcastle, or as I did yesterday, watching her play the violin for about five hours, that cannot be replaced. We need to spend more time in the Word of God with our kids. We're not here on this earth to make our kids happy. We're here to make our kids holy, to teach them the fundamentals of God's Word, and to instill in them the importance of being obedient to Him. But you know, if it isn't all of these material consumer things that we're striving after, some of us are just so preoccupied with work itself. I want to tell you a story. Ella had been told a tragic story of a man who was a workaholic. When he died at the age of 51, his obituary said that the cause of his death was a coronary thrombosis. I, I probably misspelled or mispronounced that. Thrombosis. But most people knew better. At the office six days a week, often until eight or nine at night. His friends and family said that he simply worked himself to death. Yet on the day of his funeral, when the company was already making inquiries about his replacement, the president looked around the office for candidates and said, well, who's been working the hardest? But you want to know the, the punchline was delivered by the dead man's wife. When a friend said, I know how much you will miss him, she said, oh, I already have. Now, the point in that is, before the man died, he was already dead to her. And the reason is, is because he was always consumed with work, with his labor trying to get ahead, trying to finish the project. And his presence was never in the house. His relationship with his wife was null and void. He was dead before he had died. You know, Solomon again speaks to the meaninglessness of, of labor in chapter 4 of Ecclesiastes. He talks about this man who was alone in verse 8, and he had neither son nor brother. And there was no end to his toil. Yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. And he continued to toiling. And yet Solomon concludes that this too is meaningless. In fact, he exclaims further and says it's a miserable business. Our labor... Our work is futile if all we're doing is trying to accrue more things. If all we're trying to do in our labor is to get more. 
If in our work we are not being good stewards of what God has given us, it means nothing. And if in our labor we are not serving our higher power, then our labor is futile. By the way, God is not saying he wants us to be lazy as the opposite extreme to workaholism. God indeed wants us to work with what we have, with our hands, as Paul has put it. But we also understand that we are not working for man, per se. We are working for God, and so we do want to be diligent workers. But we also appreciate and understand outside of that, work itself has no meaning. Work in and of itself is not going to get us into heaven. You all right with that? And you know, if some of us are not obsessed with our work, some of us might be obsessed with, with status, with, with being recognized or acknowledged or, or seen in high esteem by others. You know, some of us chase after that university degree, that bachelor's degree, and we work hard so that we can say, I have a BA in business, or I have a, a CPA, or I have a, a BA in sociology or history. That BA degree is chasing after the wind. Some of us can, can proudly say we have a master's degree. Maybe we have a master's degree in science. Maybe you have a master's degree in education. Whatever master's degree you may have, that too is chasing after the wind. When you get to heaven, God is not going to ask you to show your credentials. He's not going to look for those certificates that you may have framed in your office or in your house. God does not care about your master's degree, you know. And can I also say God does not care about your doctorate degree. He doesn't care if you are referred to as doctor this or doctor that. He doesn't care if the PhD took you four years or ten years. Because if you didn't spend time in God's house, if you didn't spend time worshiping him, and if you didn't obey the gospel, but you have a PhD, that degree means nothing. And some of us... If it isn't the degree, it's the worldly wisdom. You know, when, when Paul went to Athens, he, he commended them, at least initially, and probably superficially, for their knowledge and their philosophies and all of that, and all the different gods they had. But you know, the truth of the matter is, we have a God who's going to judge us. And he's not going to judge us on how much we know. He's going to judge us on how well did we obey his commands. God, God isn't interested in your smarts. He's not interested in all the different philosophies that you may know or be able to expound upon. God wants you to be humbled and to be obedient to his word. So titles, degrees, rank, and earthly honors aren't important to God. As you know this week, there's been great debate about our national heroes. I want you to know that, 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 that that's good for the Bahamas, the debate and the discussion. But when you get to God, he's going to be looking at your heart. And he's going to be asking, what have you done for me? How have you spent your time on earth? Have you spent it acquiring wealth? Have you spent it working day in and day out for the man? Or have you spent it getting to know me? through the word that I have given you. You know, there have been many wise persons of man's wisdom who have been deficient in the area of God's wisdom. You know, man's wisdom doesn't compare at all. It pales in comparison to God's wisdom. King Rehoboam, for example, who was successor of Solomon, he sought the counsel of older men who are wise in God's ways, but he chose to ignore them. And in fact, he listened to his younger counterparts who basically told him that he should tax the people heavier than his father had. And that turned out to be an awful decision that he made. It led to great sin, and Israel really never recovered from that. And so we have to understand that, as Paul has said it himself, you know, 
And if you want, turn to 1 Corinthians 3, verse 18 to 19. It says, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. You got that? God, it, he doesn't want your worldly wisdom, your philosophies, your ideas, your notions and potions. God wants your heart and God wants you to adhere to his wisdom found in his inspired word. Now, well, if it isn't the material things of this world, if it isn't the work that obsesses us day and night, if it isn't the status that comes with degrees and rank and honor, then it must be worldly pleasures that keep us chasing after the wind. Let me tell you a story. This is a real story. Some of you will remember a few years ago, Senator John Edwards from the US. He was a rising star in the political world. He was uncommonly good looking. He had an uncanny political ability. And he had an American dream story. He seemed destined to be the future president of the United States of America. In fact, he was a senator, John Kerry's running mate in 2004, when they lost to the Bush-Cheney ticket. Senator Edwards started posturing himself around 2008 for a run at the presidency, when allegations started surfacing about an extramarital affair. At first, no one wanted to believe it. Eventually, a child was born that was said to be the child of Senator Edwards. Do you know he actually had someone lie and try and cover up? His name was Andrew Young. But later, Andrew Young recanted and he wrote a book detailing how Senator Edwards had asked him to pose as the father. So the bottom end in all of this is that someone's most promising political career was brought to a crashing halt because of his foolish dalliance into adultery. You see, worldly pleasures are facade. They're folly. They're pleasurable for a moment, but they have dangerous consequences, don't they? Amen, walls. You know, Satan likes to flatter us with a falsehood. He wants us to color up and believe that this worldly pleasure is worth something. He doesn't want you to know and believe that the, the, the short span of time of that pleasure is worth it. He wants you to believe that, that you could have pleasure without consequences. And he wants you to believe that pleasure and, and hedonism is better than reverence and respect to God's way. But yet we, we succumb to that desire all the time, don't we? And when we talk about worldly pleasures, um, some of you may be thinking of the, the carnal desires of, of sex and, and lust, wild orgies and fornication and homosexuality. Know that those desires, they, especially when you're young, they, they're difficult to overcome sometimes. But I want you to know, greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world. And that short little period of, of fornication might feel good. But after it's done and you're soiled, how do you feel then? How does it make you feel on the inside? And Paul tells us that that sexual sin is like no other sin. It's a sin against your own body. And so know that when you, when you engage in that momentary fleeting pleasure, it does have an effect. And it is, in fact, chasing after the wind. Some of us are preoccupied with, with appearances. Some of us spend a lot of time in the, the beauty parlor. Some of us are, are buying creams of all kind to let, make us look young. And some of us spend a lot of time in front of the mirror. Some of us are buying things that are expensive to make our appearance outwardly look better. Does God care about your outward appearance? I read from 1 Peter chapter 3 and I understand that what God is looking for is that faithful servant, the inner man or inner woman 
like Sarah. It's not the adornment in your hair and what you put on your body. It's the inner man, that place of holiness and sanctification. God wants us holy. God does not care about the outward appearance. And yet we are so preoccupied. Do you know that it explains me as I drive around now? So it seems like on every street, we have now a beauty store, a beauty supply store. Have you noticed the proliferation of beauty supply stores? I go in there from time to time, not for myself. <laughs> for family members. But I notice they are very much all over the place. And next to those beauty stores, we find that other pleasure-seeking place called the local liquor store or bar. Do you notice, too, on our streets in Nassau, New Providence, we have many bars and liquor stores by different names, different titles, and different proprietors. But we have the beauty store and the bar. And many people are spending far too much time. Their time is being spent on these pleasure-seeking devices. They're not spending their time in the right place. But Greg, can I drop an anchor here and talk about sports? You know, too many of us young men, Greg, watch way too much sports. I am guilty of this as well. We will spend countless hours watching Wimbledon, the, the great marathon matches over the last few days. It can become absorbing into our mental state. And while watching it, are we thinking about God? Are we meditating on the Word? Are we watching the, the latest NBA Finals with too much enthusiasm? Sports can be an addiction too, you know. And the time we spend on the TV and in front of the TV and watching and following on Facebook or, or on the internet, our favorite teams, that's time taken away from what God wants us to do. That's time we could have been spending out preaching the word. That's time we could have been out praying to God, door knocking, doing a Bible study, that TV time, that sport sucking the life out of many young, middle-aged, and old men, and dare I say some women as well. And sister, Freddie, you know what else? Food. Food is a pleasure that some of us are well familiar with. Some of us spend a lot of time planning the next restaurant outing we're going to go to. Planning the next meal that we're going to cater. Planning out what we're going to eat for the next five days. We spend a lot of time thinking about food. Some of you are thinking about food right now. As you're getting close to the midnight or midday hour, I should say. The whole thing and what I'm saying is the pleasures of this world, they are very enticing, aren't they? They're very tempting. But God wants our heart to be on the right things. He wants us to spend our time well. He wants us to crucify the flesh. He wants us to live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. I want to end by returning to the book of Ecclesiastes. But before I do that, I have one last story for you. I want to tell you the story about Chuck, Chuck Colson. Ten years after finishing law school, Chuck Colson found himself working in the White House, appointing a special counsel to President Nixon in 1969, responsible for inviting influential private special interest groups into the White House policy-making process and winning their support on special issues. For four glorious years, he was known and recognized as Nixon's hatchet man. He dispensed favors and issued orders in the name of the president. Colson confessed he was valuable to the president because I was willing to be ruthless in getting things done. Then came Watergate. And he was implicated along with other Nixon aides. In 1974, Colston 
pleaded guilty to obstruction of justice. He was given a one to three year sentence, fined 5,000 and disbarred in prison. A dramatic thing happened. A proud man, he accepted Jesus Christ into his life. Now, I don't know if he was baptized. Got to be careful on these things, right? But the point I'm making here was this man, he had gained everything. He was famous. He had, in fact, 15 honorary doctorate degrees. 15. He had gained the esteem of man. He had gained a high profile position. He had gained a lot of money. But in prison, he was humbled. All of that was a loss to him. He counted those things as nothing because he understood that the only thing that mattered in life was as Solomon said at the end of Ecclesiastes, Fear God and keep his commandments for that is the whole duty of man. I am here today to tell you that what you do in this life, in this walk, has absolutely no meaning at all unless your life is focused on Christ first. Christ must be first in your life. In everything that you do, you must put Christ first. When you have put on Christ in the watery grave of baptism, and you come upwards out of that grave, a new man, a new woman, a new creature of Christ, having disregarded Satan and his lies, having given your life to Christ in baptism, you are now a slave to righteousness. And because you are a slave to righteousness and you're serving King Jesus, everything in your life now has meaning and purpose. Your work has purpose because you're not working for that man, that boss. You're working for Jesus. And when you go out on the streets of Nassau, you're not enticed by the bar or the numbers man. You're not enticed by all the beauty aids because you've been sanctified by Christ. You are dressed in the new apparel as you put on Christ in baptism. And you are beautiful in Christ. And when you are a child of God, you are not consumed with rank and status and honor because you are already a member of his holy priesthood. As he has said so in 1 Peter chapter 2. Am I right in saying that? You are sanctified. You are set apart. You don't need to be called by any earthly title, doctor this, or some would even say reverend, as we know that is not in scripture. Only God is reverend. Titles don't mean anything to you anymore. So I'm here today to tell you to spend your time well. Because a well spent life is worth living. And I know for myself, I haven't been given the, the message for my only child. I intend to do things differently. I already have, you know. At the end of this month, I am no longer chair of the School of Social Science. I might still be an associate professor of history at the University of the Bahamas, but you know, first and foremost, I am Brother Chris, and I am a Christian. That's all that matters to me. If you have any concerns this morning, if you need prayers, this message is for you. Or perhaps you're a Christian, but you've been struggling with something. One of those worldly pleasures I mentioned. Whatever may be your challenge, this is an opportunity for us to pray for you. And if you're not a Christian, you understand that your whole life has no purpose, has no meaning right now. Meaning only comes by obeying the gospel and being baptized for your sins. Otherwise, you are in the same camp as Solomon at the beginning of Ecclesiastes when he said, meaningless, 
All is meaningless. Nothing but meaningless. Come now as we stand and sing the song of meditation.